Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, this is Double Feature, and today here getting electrocuted is Michael Kester. It's me, I'm getting electrocuted. God, I fucking love that song <laughs> so much. Um, we're going to do two movies today that are, I guess it's photography day on Double sure, Feature. it's photography day. I'm not really sure. You would still call look photography, I There's, guess, in its well, most basic it, form. Yeah, sure. Candidacy, maybe. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about... Uh, we're Candidness, not, gonna... not candidacy. We're not talking about politics, we're talking about being candid. Movies here on Double Feature. Get your fucking facts straight. There's a little voyeurism going on on our show today, yeah. and oddly not in the John Waters movie, which huh. is the strangest part. But yeah, we also have John Waters That's returning true. to uh, to our show. And Adam Rifkin returning to our show. And Edward Furlong returning to our show. Anyways, we're going to spoil these movies today. And uh, you know you can't spoil a John Waters movie. That's I right. Don't care if you fucking it only know gets what better the, the more spoiling you do. It's true. It's true. But we are going to spoil. Look, look has some twists and turns, but I don't think anyone really gives a shit. Yeah, right. I would have. Now I warned people last week about Look, and what I should have said is that it's hella independent. Uh-huh. I think that would have been. It's also shot from the point of view of surveillance yeah, cameras. Well, you said to me going into it that it was verbatim quote hella independent right. thank you my co-host eric ingram right you can't tell i you don't think tell. so no i mean the i there were actors i recognize that's something that doesn't happen in most yeah, of the films I, I watch you know me i don't recognize actors yeah and also everything looks like it was shot on shitty surveillance well cameras. but that's the that's the gimmick right that's it the, is that's it how you get is. around doing something independently is, is well maybe find what i a meant medium where shitty cameras are allowable maybe what i meant instead of um hella independent is Hella experimental. There we Is go. That, that's a little better. Bam, hella. Yeah, so if you haven't seen that yet, you need to actually perform the experiment before you listen to the show. And the John Waters one, I don't know, maybe we'll talk you into watching a John Waters movie. But if you haven't seen Look, use the chapters, skip to Pecker. And if you haven't uh, seen Pecker, I guess you can skip to the end of the show. Yeah, just skip right on to the end. It's just a formality. You know, it'll take you like two minutes. Don't even start with me in the fucking formalities this week. Do you remember all the way back when we did um, REC, a million dollar hotel? No. There was another, well, we did on the show. Okay. Uh, there was another show loosely based on voyeurism, I suppose, or what kind of turned into a show yeah. loosely based. It was about apartments. Yeah. But suddenly, yeah. and it's always creepy when you're watching a movie and you pair them up for a completely simple, right. harmless reason, and it turns into a double feature right. about voyeurism. And mindless zombies. Thanks, Mel Gibson. You remember that movie a lot differently than I do. I mentioned at the time something called the HBO Voyeur Project, which was this thing that um, sort of a viral, it's hard to really explain what it is. It was um, a little thing HBO put up on a website where you could watch this entire building of people. You would just, uh, it, it was as if you were across the street and you could see in all their windows and different stories would play out in different windows. And it's something that you can still find online. And I encourage people to go look that up. But I'm always interested in finding these kind of fly on the wall uh, vantage points from which to view things, because I find that naturally uh, a project that entails that tells you a lot less up front. Mm -hmm. And that's just something I enjoy. So when I heard about Look, I was really excited about that because that's the gimmick, right? It's all from surveillance footage. And the movie starts, you know, telling us that we're shot so many times a day and it, the whole packaging of it is um, intentionally deceptive. Yeah. As if it's, you know, is it okay to be filmed in your workplace? And should you be worried about Big Brother? But the movie's not really about Big Brother at all. No. It's not at instead all. about what the hell are these people doing right. on the surveillance footage? And so that narrative is left for you to figure out. And, are we talking uh, about the movie now? <clears throat> we are. Okay. <laughs> just make sure. I didn't say the movie at the, t- at the top yeah. of the piece. I just yeah, didn't you like know. that? I'm mixing it up. That's great. It was really, really smooth. <laughs> oh, fuck you. That's what the chapters no, are I'm for. Proud. So you know when I I'm start serious. talking. About I, was con- I was like, whoa, when did we? <laughs> oh, did I that. like, pass out? This is A game today. Holy shit. <laughs> 
So that's the only context for the film. Right. You don't know if it's going to be one story or several stories or who your characters are. Uh-huh. You don't really know a whole lot about it at all. Right. Well, you never really get characters. Right. You're kind of exposed to a bunch of different people all doing different things. And the strange thing is that some of the people play out in full stories right. where others graduate and you're supposed to care <laughs> just as much about every single story as if for some reason we're supposed to believe that all people have some level of importance. Yeah, some are full stories. Some are uh, more like snippets. Mm-hmm. They kind of come in at different points in a person's life, in a person's story. And some I think you're probably referring to the student who graduates. Yeah, some of them don't. <laughs> you're nodding. No one can hear you nod, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, some of them just don't matter as much. Some of them are red herrings in how this entire thing is put together. The first one we actually see, I mean, the movie starts on tits. Which on tits. Normally a pretty good place to start your movie. You know, especially on double feature. Really, it's a really good kind of go to in any movie when you don't know what to do. Right. Tits is usually a great start option. on tits. Unfortunately, they're teenage girl tits. And unfortunately, the teenage girls are really annoying. Yeah. So I think the movie actually starts in a in a manner that's probably as awkward and abrasive as possible. Sure. I mean, you're in this changing room. You're from a, a vantage point where, all right, we're talking about voyeurism. You're in the spot you're not supposed to be. Right. If someone caught you watching videotape of, say, an elevator, yeah, that eh, doesn't really matter. A convenience store, you know, okay, what are you looking at? Interesting. But you're in a changing room at this point. So we're already kind of making the audience, you know, question all these different things. Well, and the other thing that I think really works about starting in the changing room is when you read the initial title cards right. where it tells you four billion hours of blah, blah information right. every day. The first thing that goes into your head is where are they watching me that I don't want to be watched? Right. Are they watching me shower? Right. Do they see me jerk off? Right. So immediately the first thing they do is they're watching you in the changing room. Right. So it accomplishes that. It makes you think about the um one of the overall i guess it's a kind of a motif mm-hmm. of the movie but not something that's focused on you know it's a question for people to ponder but it's not making an actual it's not taking a stance on that right it's simply saying all right these cameras are everywhere fact what's captured on these cameras and here's one instance of that that'll you know make your mind race in a million different places the other thing that does and i think this is one of the most interesting concepts of the movie it just gets to it right off the bat what are people doing when no one is looking, when they think they're not being mm-hmm. watched? You know, this girl is in the changing room before she's being annoying with her friend. Uh-huh. And she's kind of, you know, primping. Uh-huh. She's adjusting. She's uh, doing these things that you, you probably wouldn't do just standing around sure. in the mall or, you know, trying on a, a hat in a store in the mall. But she's alone in this room. And so it kind of gets to this question are these different motions you do, are they universal? Does every human being go into a changing room and, you know, push their breasts together and sort of examine themselves in the mirror? Or I guess that gets to a different question. Is it different for the different sexes? Right. I don't push my boobs together in a dressing room. No, I don't. But maybe that's something women do. It's possible. And so the question starts to come up, I mean, for the opposite sex, for other cultures, what sort of things... You know, when we have the um, the Hispanic babysitter, she sits around and watches Hispanic TV. Mm-hmm. And so the people who are who are actually setting up the nanny cam, they're thinking, what deviant things are they doing sure. to my child? Are they shaking the baby around? And so their expectations happen to be a lot different than the real thing she's doing. So there's, you know, there's an inherent flaw in that this is one person's idea right. about, you know, what these other things do. But uh, does that invalidate the questions or, I mean, how do you feel about the fact that this is basically Adam Rifkin's mm-hmm. take on what everybody does, right? I mean, he, he may have asked some people. Well, here's kind of the influences that come to play whenever you start making a film, no matter how experimental. If Adam Rifkin, if we were to have a conversation with Adam Rifkin. Director of Detroit Rock City. Director of Detroit Rock City. Okay, so let me, can I aside to Adam Rifkin yeah, before yeah, I please. talk about our conversation with him? Our imaginary conversation. Right. 
Adam Rifkin directed Detroit Rock City, which mm-hmm. we did back with Christmas on Mars. I think yeah. we both had a good time with that show. Yeah, absolutely. But he also directed this thing for National Lampoons. It has two names, and I don't remember the oh, one I'm I rented already. it as. Right. But the secondary name was called Stoned Age. Oh, God. And it has Giuseppe Andrews. It has the guy, the other guy, the actor who is not really a worker at the convenience store. Oh, it's right. It's horrendous. It's an absolutely atrocious film. Sure. This film was one of the most intriguing i did not expect this to come from the guy that made stoned age well one's an art film and one is a red box film exactly and so i i would like to uh just kind of give my kudos to adam rifkin for having your hat perhaps yeah, for having some sort of you know creative gravity uh outside of like handing poop to each other <laughs> right stoned age everybody did, did that really happen in stoned age so if i had a conversation oh, with adam rifkin he might attest to something like you or I would attest to if you were to say, what would happen if you were to watch all the surveillance footage on Earth? Odds are nothing. People would come into the Seven Eleven down the street here, buy a fucking Red Bull, go to work. Right. I love that, too. There's no secret truths right. revealed. It's not saying something deeper about, you know, Big Brother and our government and what the government's doing in the back or how things really work at the... Right. It's just people. And the thing is, is... As soon as you start making a film, you have to cut out all of the boring stuff that would actually happen. And you essentially have to go and take all of that four billion hours of footage Mm -hmm. and find the most interesting hour and a half of it. Right. And stick it together in some sort of story where, and that's what film is, right? You forego at some level of suspension of disbelief. In this case, we have to go, this is all really happening. Yeah. And it's all connected. But if you look at it on the scale of four billion hours to this hour and a half, Mm -hmm. it's not so unlikely. So you're just saying that among all of the footage that's out there, finding instances of people doing these particular things... You're going to find people fucking in a storeroom. Right. You're going to find people walking around cheap creeping little girls because sure. people actually do that it's right. not the film is not based on unfounded truths of there are suspicions that men fuck in the story right, right well it's, it's also not the median it's not the average exactly we're not saying that all girls get into a dressing room and push their boobs together and then they're check out each other's and, buttholes yeah pretends to right talk about bleaching assholes we're just saying that that happened once somewhere so i guess it would be even more unfair to to say that, you know, these people, they're not representations of everyone else. Mm -hmm. They just happen to be individuals who are, they're examples. Exactly. They're examples. But that's not the only thing the film is tackling. That's right. That's one minor part of it. I mean, another is practical jokes, which I always love to see the setup of practical jokes, whether it's the cola or the car or the sour cream. That arc is one of the most interesting ones in the film, I think. It's the strangest. Yeah, it is. No matter how many times I watch Look, I always forget to check to see if the blue hat was there. Uh I love that you are just chastised as an audience member for not seeing the blue hat. Right. You know, normally in a film, that's the point where they show you a reveal and zoom in because they think you're too stupid not to see it. Uh But in this case, no one fucking saw it. And, you know, we would have known just by seeing the guy, we would have known during the reveal that that's him. But they go back to show the blue hat just to rub it in your yeah, face. To say, you've known this. You could have known yeah, this. Yeah, you weren't you were paying, paying attention, attention to this part. Exactly. And the whole movie is about what you're paying yeah. attention to. So that's completely fair. But I think that that arc is incredibly interesting because you're kind of... This guy's the, the underdog. He's getting beaten yeah. up by these you know, post-jock office workers. Right. And then at the end, you kind of wish they were doing more than sour creaming his hand. Right, if only they knew. If only they had the fucking surveillance footage mm-hmm. that we've been watching. Only they would look. Yeah, it seems like you could say that with a lot of the characters yeah. in the movie. You could say, man, if they had just seen this surveillance footage or, sure. you know, this piece. Well, it, it, it kind of becomes a model of if these people had seen the big picture... Yeah. Where would their decisions have changed? The teacher is a great example sure, of where sure. the big picture would have definitely driven him in a different direction. That's also one of the points in the movie where, you know, as we were watching this, you were seeing it for the first time. Mm-hmm. You said to me right at the point where they, it's so, it right. happens so beautifully yeah. as if it was perfectly orchestrated, you know, as if and maybe Adam, was. Adam tested this with audiences, found the point where they said, man, isn't anyone going to check this surveillance footage? Because I thought the exact same thing. You know, she's in there giving the the false confession. Fuck her for that, by the way. We'll get to that. Absolute garbage. Don't fuck her. Wait two years. Fuck her for doing that. That little bitch. You know, you start thinking, this isn't the real story. If only it had been taped. Wait, it is taped because I just saw it. 
hey, why don't they watch that tape? I just saw a tape. We know it exists. Don't these people know there's cameras? And it's not maybe 30 seconds Mm -hmm. after that comes out of your mouth, after that went through my head, that it absolutely happens. They go, hey, you know what? We uh, actually taped all this stuff. And uh, now we're going to make you watch one of those tapes. Another one of the things I like is this idea that you miss out on little events that happen before you show up. Right. Uh, Performance art. Yeah. Even. That's, you know, once you arrive, someone else is embarrassed. They don't want to tell you. These are secrets. Sure. That's the entire concept. It's singing in the shower. Yeah. It's the voyeurism, really. It's what draws people into cinematic voyeurism Mm -hmm. is that there's a secret. There's something unknown. And now you can see that unknown thing. And sometimes that's perverse and that's intimate. And sometimes it's quiet and weird and revealing And sometimes you're getting electrocuted. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have this scene, the Giuseppe Andrews scene, who Giuseppe Andrews, we talked about before. Cabin Fever. uh, And Cabin Fever. Detroit Rock City. And in Detroit Rock City, sure. Was also in that spectacular Cabin Fever sequel. Yeah, no, Cabin Fever 2 is definitely something. That's That's Ty West. The Ty West movie, right? And he was in 2001 Maniacs. Wow, we're all over Giuseppe Uh, Andrews. He is all over the place. So he starts singing the song, I'm Getting Electrocuted. Which, by the way, will be my iPhone ringtone from the second we finish the show. I'm Mm going to see to it that that happens. And I encourage our listeners to do that as well. And a customer comes in. And as I'm watching this, I'm enjoying it so much. I don't know why, but he's playing the stupid fucking Casio keyboard like he's Jonathan goddamn Carpenter. And it's already pretty good. But then he starts singing in this i don't even know if it's a falsetto it's just this kind it's a of whine whiny it's just a whine yeah and it's pretty amazing and if i heard you know a clerk doing that I, it would be great but he's embarrassed and he stops uh-huh. when the customer comes in which of course makes you think what else am i missing out sure. on when i'm that customer and not from this vantage point up here and i think it's great that giuseppe andrews did these songs i mean when you check the credits he wrote a bunch mm-hmm. of these and so the music You know, instead of having, well, I guess it is a full original soundtrack, right? Mm -hmm. It's these Giuseppe Andrews songs. And, you know, uh, a moment will come where we need a montage of a slow song or whatever. And rather than getting too serious, rather than really going into that Magnolia territory, crash, babble, that kind of stuff, all these interweaving stories and look at the emotional connection and this part's going to be important. Different people in the same world. (laughs) Right. And they're all having a bad time right now thinking about it together. And it might get too heavy. And the film might have even earned it at that point. But instead, you get a whiny Giuseppe Andrews Uh song that just pulls it back enough to go, all right, we're serious. We're not that serious. So that stuff is perfect. So I kind of wanted to take a step aside from all the things the movie's doing and kind of talk about how it's doing that Uh stuff. You know, that's one of the technical questions that probably comes up as you're watching this. Um, I knew little to nothing about it. So the first question I had is, is this a documentary? What's going on here? It really wasn't until I started seeing the overacting with the girls or uh, the stuff with fucking sleazy Tony, Mm -hmm. big Tony, not little Tony, that I started thinking, okay, well, now I know this is this is fiction, obviously. But all right. Is this actual surveillance footage? Is it coming from cameras? You know, how is this thing accomplished? And you pay a little bit of attention to that, probably more so at the beginning. What do the tickers say? How is that kind of that destruction of the footage coming along? And uh, if you'll notice at the very end of the movie, they credit, you know, they actually list the cameras Uh that were used with it. It was a, um, the Sony, I think they're called um, Cine Alta, which is the same type of camera, the same Sony cameras that were used for Sin City. They were used for Spy Kids 2, some of the uh, Rodriguez stuff, Cloverfield, which is another thing that kind of comes to mind when you're looking at a film like this. And I think it's really amazing to see that, you know, this wasn't just, they didn't just take these mini DV cameras and film it and get the same shitty look for everything. They went through the trouble of filming everything with relatively similar cameras. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, as far as I know in the credits, it's only the two cameras that they really talk about. And then going through each piece and saying, all right, if this camera was planted here, how would it look? What kind of footage is it? How should the footage be labeled? making sure all of the timestamps line up to give it that kind of authenticity. So you know at the very least that they were thinking about those vantage points as they wrote and filmed the movie too. And all of these cameras were actually put in spots where you had, you know, surveillance cameras. Right. So while they didn't actually jack a monitor into a camera on a bus or an ATM, 
you still had a camera positioned in that exact same spot. Mm-hmm. And they went through those, you know, those kind of pains to make that look authentic. Which brings up another question about the cinematography, because this is basically the opposite of every movie ever made, you know, the cinematography right. you would see in anything else. Everything is from high angles, an angle you would pretty much never film in for any right. reason. There's no close ups. Mm-hmm. You don't get any, you know, you never see a close up of an actor's face. There's like odd digital zoom that maybe comes in now and right. again, but it's right. never the kind of close up where by the time you get close enough, everybody looks like gray and pink pixels. Well, it's not, yeah, it's not the emotional close ups. Right. You know, it's not how you traditionally think I'm ready for my close up close ups. It's instead them pushing in and they push in after the fact too. You'll notice that on some of the, the scenes where they have that, uh, the really great jarring, you know, camera moving on angles as if the surveillance cameras were kind of, you know, on some sort of rail mm-hmm. or when they zoom past the timestamp because it's actually that sort of fourth wall zooming into the footage that's already right, been taken. Right. That's why you get the more, the more grainy pixelated stuff. And so, you know, you don't, you can barely identify any of these actors. I mean, I certainly can't because I suck with actors. Right. But you could pick out who these people were. I know you had a little bit of trouble sometimes going, is that that guy? Who's this guy? Right. And, you know, we had to check for a lot of that stuff. And then you also have, you know, a betrayal of everything you learn about cinematography. You have no, even something basic like the rule of thirds, you know, just how the eye sees things that are aesthetically pleasing, where you should you know, how you should compose your shot. Mm -hmm. I mean, people's heads are off in the lower right-hand corner. They're barely visible in the frame. You can see everyone's entire body. I just go through a Hollywood film and tell me how many times you see a person from head to toe or a person from head to toe 20 feet away. Right. It's just such a bizarre thing to see. It kind of just made everything going on seem like there was a little bit more gravity to it. There was, the acting seemed less like something I was worried about. Right. I was far more you weren't thinking how is this scene being acted yeah, out exactly i was sure. far more concerned with the story with the characters kind of doing what they're doing i mean to put it in terms of context of the film the teacher who fucks the 16 year old right that whole story was far more compelling than it would have been had it been you know close-ups and perfectly lit and everybody's kind of doing everything the sure, way that it would have sure. been in a hollywood film because I would sit there going, well, he's not really fucking a 16-year-old. Right. But by the time you have the shot in the parking lot of that happening, and then it finishes, and then I turn to you and I was like, that that sucks. Yeah. That feeling he has right now. Yeah, you're thinking about what he's going yeah. through. Yeah, I found that I spent a lot less time thinking about the technicality of things, mm-hmm. thinking about what is the scene trying to tell me. What are they doing in the story at this moment? What are they trying to convey? I mean, part of that is just, you know, being so analytical watching movies right. and knowing we have to talk about them an hour yeah. later. But the other part is just you don't think about the construction of that. I mean, you have this complete depth of field where everything in the frame is in focus. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's no uh, there's no shallow depth where, you know, you're focusing on an actor and the movie's telling you what to look at. You have a wide open depth of field. You could stare at the bag of chips in the foreground or the magazines in the background, and you know what's going on around you at all times. You know, you see that scene outside, uh, specifically the the one night vision shot, mm-hmm. right? The scene right. where they actually fuck. And you know the girl standing there before he even knows that. Yeah. You're more aware of the environment than the people in the movie, which is perfectly suited for that idea we talked about of you know, if only they had all the pieces, right? If only they saw the big picture, the way we're seeing the big picture in the movie. And so it's a a happy accident, I guess that surveillance cameras don't have a shallow depth of field that we can also see that visually in the frame in their environment. So one thing that happens in this film that we also saw in teeth, and I'm going to dub on double feature as humana dentata. All right, I'm in. Is when everyone involved in the story is just scummy and dirty and bad. Oh my God, I know. It's, it's, in Teeth we saw it because all the dudes were kind of jerks. In this, everybody has this, it's, it's kind of, I guess the, what, the dark secret theory. Right. That everyone has something that they do behind closed doors that they would never let anyone know. But the reality is that's not the case. Yeah, I was curious as I was watching this. I don't lie nearly as much. Yeah. As... 
anyone in mm-hmm. the even the most honest people, even the the fucking lawyer. Uh, I just don't. Do you lie this much no. in your normal day to day life? Especially not about things this, that are this big of a deal. Right. I've I've found in my youth that when you lie about huge secrets, it gets worse later. Oh yeah. When you lie about no, honey, I don't make out with other lawyers in the other <laughs> right. Day. That right. turns into a bigger deal when, say, your daughter's missing and then she right. finds out. And in this film, it just kind of and again, maybe it's because we're centering on just a specific group sure. of people. But everybody's got something going on. Everybody's cheating on everyone. Right. And some people are killing people for no reason. Well, and I think that's a trick of the film. Sure. I think rather than using this as another opportunity to focus on honest humanity, I think instead we're going, well, we'll construct our narrative out of liars. And so the natural tendency of at least the honest people in the audience, if not everybody in the audience, will be to be surprised when Mm -hmm. we find out about these lies. Somebody like Tony, I mean, that's such an interesting character for as much of a douchebag as that guy is, because Tony is, you know, my opinion on him changed so much. He's sleazy, right? I mean, that at at the very least, he's sleazy. But when he has that confrontation with the other woman Mm -hmm. who finds out that he's sleeping with everybody, she confronts him. And I actually feel like he's, although he's the dirtbag, he's the one who's right in that situation. He as says, far as we know. Yeah, well, he says, okay, let's be honest. We're two adults having fun. You're not going to leave your husband for me. So, you know, I don't do drugs. I don't drink. This is my vice. Right. Sex. And so I'm thinking, all right, well, Tony's kind of a cool guy sure. here. Maybe it's just because we're watching a film full of fucking liars and dirtbags that I think, wow, Tony, you're a jerk. Mm-hmm. And he's, I mean, just the way he talks to people about sure. balls and little Tony and stuff. He's yeah. not the kind of, I mean, if I met this guy, I would think, wow, what a douchebag. Yeah. But now I start thinking, all right, he's got the only correct approach. He's the person I can most agree with, even if I don't really like the guy. Mm-hmm. But then you find out it's a lie. Right. You see him snorting something, yeah. which I, I didn't even remember from the last time sure. I watched the movie. I just put that out of my mind, probably because I needed to identify with somebody. And you hate him again, right? Yep. I mean, you fucking can't stand the guy. But I wonder, you know, the girl then lies to him about sexual harassment. Uh-huh. I mean, do you hate her after that? I just, every, by that point, everybody's lied except Giuseppe Andrews. Right. All right. He's sure. the, and, and, and then he's the one that gets 50,000. I mean, I think that if the film <laughs> the is saying anything it, is that yeah. the honest person gets 50 grand. There's something instinctively human about me that says the girl who lied about sexual harassment, she got revenge. She fucked with the guy and good for her. But in the end, that just makes her a fucking liar, too. Yeah, I, I shouldn't mean, like her anymore for that. sour cream in the dust drawer. Well, let's look at one that's a little more difficult then. What about somebody like, you know, like the teacher? Mm-hmm. I mean, you almost feel sympathetic for the teacher. Sure. Do you think he earned that? Yeah. Well, the thing, the thing is, is he was in the wrong. He knew the law. Okay. Mm-hmm. He cheated on his wife, which is clearly immoral. So he does have that strike against him. Sure. And he also has the knowledge of legality against him. So what he's doing is wrong. But sure. You think maybe the movie's being sympathetic the of The movie's him? being sympathetic. He's been baited. He's But he gave in. The thing that sucks, and, and I don't know if, how strong of a statement the movie's trying to make, is that he literally made one mistake. Right. And he's going to go to prison for 10 years, lose custody of his child, divorce his wife. His life is ruined by a single mistake that he was baited into making. So maybe it's saying something more specific about the mistake, Mm -hmm. how one mistake, because that's the first thing I thought of, just thinking, wow, that one fucking mistake he made, which was very deliberate and very his fault. He gave in. Exactly. And, you know, as the the lawyer says, you can sympathize with him. You can go, the girl was really fucking devious. The movie tries really hard. It makes no mistake about showing how sexually charged she is, Mm -hmm. how devious she is. The first fucking thing we see in the whole movie is, is the girl getting naked and talking about bleached assholes. Right. And then on top of it, you know, it shows the drooling old man who's constantly encouraging it over and over. Did you sleep with that girl yet? You know, these horny young girls, they all like it. But then there comes a point where he does just give in. And that mistake costs him that time. So the thing, at least, that comes to my mind is rather than, you know, again, as we said with the other stuff, moralizing or trying to pick a position somewhere or say something is right or wrong it's more just man that sucks sure he made a really dumb sure. decision he betrayed his wife he did the thing that was yeah. at the very least legally wrong 
and so he's going to suffer for the next 10 years. Yeah, you kind of find yourself wondering where along the lines of the story he regrets giving in to young Poontang. You know, you ask where in his character arc was that? Where did he fall prey to that? We don't really have a lot of setup about him. Mm-hmm. We don't know, you know, much of who he is as a person. It's it's really similar to, you know, to look at the two guys, the what is it, candid camera killers, right? Yeah. And to think about, I mean, the one guy who filled in as store clerk, Giuseppe Andrew's sure. friend, he the the thing he fucking says in the movie is so perfect. He talks about no way I know those guys. Those are nice guys. Mm-hmm. Because his experience with those guys was nothing but positive. He was in a shitty situation himself. He was focused on the register. Mm -hmm. We saw things a little more objectively, but he saw things very specifically in his situation. And these guys didn't give him shit. They gave him some money. And so we know, we saw the other footage. We know they're the candid camera killers. We have that background. And he doesn't. And I think that's very similar. You know, the movie somehow manages to put us in his frame of mind with somebody else, like Mm -hmm. the teacher, but then also give us his situation and allow him to comment on it to see how the scope looks from beyond that character. Right. So there's a Showtime series on Look. I haven't seen it yet because I don't have Showtime. Mm -hmm. I don't fucking have cable TV because I get everything digitally. But uh, it's on at, I think it was on at midnight on Sunday or something. That's a terrible time slot. Yeah, right? What is that? But, you know, I'll have to get it on DVD or something. I'm sure it's awesome. The very last shot in this movie is one of my favorites. And, you know, as I start to say some of these things, I feel like, oh, yeah, that's really obvious, you know, when you sort of go back over it. You know, we talk about uh, moralizing in Mm -hmm. the movie, coming up with, uh, you know, the right side of things. And just when you thought you got to a scene, you're ready for the film to deliver some moral justice as maybe it did with the teacher. His actions at least caught up with him. Mm -hmm. You could mistake that for the movie laying down moral justice. Reap what you sow. Right. So we see the guy, the man in the blue hat, Mm -hmm. who's been fucked with at work, and who's, you know, probably a pedophile, suggestively a pedophile. Kidnapped children. Yeah, right. At the very least. Sure, and so the cops show up to get him, and instead of it being a cop, the movie goes, no, you know what? No moral justice here. It turns out he's just being fucked with Again, yeah, which you could almost see as moral justice. There's almost something karmic about that. Yeah. That you know he's going to continue to be tortured for the things that he's doing. Sure, uh, but it's really more just funny. Yeah, it's kind of it's funny and disappointing and honest and true all at the same time. Oh God, fucking amazing! Uh, let's talk about Pecker. Okay, Pecker is uh, it's what you have dubbed what the last of the first mainstream John Waters films. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a whole decade of that stuff. I mean, there's we talked about polyester right. on the show, and before we talked about polyester, we talked about Dirty Shame, right? Which is clearly in the mainstream. Yeah, well, so, you have Johnny Knoxville in there. Yeah, I sure. Mean, that David Hasselhoff shows up. That is, there is he has finally made it. <laughs> right. I just read an amazing interview with John Waters where he was talking about uh, his favorite film from the last year was Jackass 3D, mm-hmm. and he felt like. Johnny Knoxville and friends were uh, the only ones doing what he did in the old days. The only ones really making movies in that spirit. And I thought that was pretty amazing. Yeah. I never thought I'd find myself in a position where I was interested or liking Jackass. Mm -hmm. But kind of after we did A Dirty Shame, I thought twice about that stuff. And it's just very interesting that that's out there. But not my point. My point was uh, when we talked about polyester, that was what we thought at the time was the first mainstream John Waters film. And when you look at it, you start to see, you know, the coherent narrative. The plot, and, right. Characters. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, as much as you can call anyone in John Waters movies Minimum a character. Minimum consumption of fecal matter. There you go. That's the one I was looking for. And so that for me, you know, I think when you really look at John Waters films, you could say that's the first mainstream one. But after Polyester, which some called the first mainstream John Waters film, you had Crybaby, also known as the first mainstream John Waters film. Mm-hmm. And then Hairspray... And Serial Mom. Both the also, first mainstream John Waters <laughs> right, film, I believe. Both of them. And so we finally get to Pecker, which is the last first mainstream right. John. I mean, I yeah. don't buy into that. I think John right. Waters has had some pretty mainstream movies sure, sure. up until this point. But I'm interested in Pecker because, you know, this is kind of the John Waters underdog film. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we can go back and forth about that. You you have a different pick. Yeah, I absolutely. I think that 
what I would consider the least successful John Waters film, not from a financial basis, mm-hmm. but the least successful John Waters film, I would say is Serial Mom. That would be my ugly duckling pick sure. for the John Waters filmography. Now, do you think that's on a whole or with the hardcore John Waters fans? I think or? that it's I think that it aggregates into as a whole but definitely sure. with John Waters fans. So you think that's where that stands out clearly? Yes. And then maybe that has such a heavy impact that it also applies yeah, on the exactly. whole Yeah, exactly. Well. I always kind of got the feeling that it was uh, Cecil B. Demented. That yeah, was the one. Yeah, that's another one too. I guess after the Pink Flamingos block of movies, everybody kind of had their own yeah. worst John Waters Their movie. own ugly duckling. Yeah, right, right. And, you know, Pecker is... Um, and it's odd that Pecker is the one I would pick for that mm-hmm. because it's not my least favorite. John no, it's Waters just film. the one with Edward Furlong. <laughs> it just happens to be the one with Edward Furlong. And as I watch it, I just go, oh, John Waters. And it, maybe it's in that, that area of John Waters movies that's so kind of scatterbrained that it's amusing to me. Mm-hmm. But I feel like there's just there's these little things I pick up on that make Pecker a film that I want to root for, you yeah. know, not just because it's the underdog. Right. I mean, you could simply do that. Right. It's Martha Plimpton well, and Christina Ricci. Yeah, that is what I think if for no other reason than Martha Plimpton and Christina Ricci, yeah. we should evangelize this film. I will, That's I the will right thing carry, to do. I will carry the colors into battle of any film with Martha Plimpton. So, I mean, I've talked about Christina Ricci before mm-hmm. and uh, it was on the Adams Family sure. show. And I remember that being a little awkward because... I'm she in was love young. with Christina yeah. Ricci and she's 13. And 16. I, she's 16. Was she 16 in the Adams Family? I don't know, but when she took off her panties in front of your car, it didn't really matter. I haven't matter. had a car in four years. So somewhere in those so numbers, 16. everything is okay. <laughs> yeah, that's maybe that's about right. That's not right at all. That math is terrible. And so what I did on that show was say, it would be really awkward if I told you how hot Christina Ricci is and how much I love her for all the things she does. Uh-huh. And then I think I just did it anyways. You did, but with so, a nice, safe precursor. So while I plan to do that in the future on the show, I think you can just go back to the Adams Family yeah, that and get works. that uh, pretty fairly. Yeah. Something that really struck me about, uh, and I guess it still does, about Christina Ricci, is I see her in all these movies, and I think she's a great actor and a great person, and I love watching her and stuff. I feel like she's not given good roles. Yeah. There are so many things. And it's not just the Adams Family Syndrome because it was such a good role and everybody saw her in that. Mm -hmm. It just went downhill from there. I don't think that's the case. I think it just happened that she has such a weird mixed collective. Yeah. It feels like at any point, Christina Ricci could be in some fucking Zack Snyder movie and everything in the world would just line up and be perfect. Mm-hmm. And I just keep waiting for that moment. It won't happen. Not, it, it's sort of what I feel about Vincent Price. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, that's a, a totally different spectrum of things. But still, Vincent Price, you're always going, what a good actor, going to get his chance to shine. And then you, he gets in it's another... Basically what it is, is, is you look at their... You look at all of the films, the span of their career, mm-hmm. and you're staring at it for days, wondering... What's the Christina Ricci right. movie? Where's the good one? Where right? is the one? Where and is I keep going that through. Is... Yeah, I keep going through and seeing them, and I never see the powerhouse movie that I'm expecting. Uh, this isn't the same for Martha. No. So I know you have been geeking out on that stuff a lot recently. Yeah. Tell me about yeah. that. Yeah. Well, Martha Plimpton, besides being fascinating. So Christina she's... Ricci is Edward Furlong's girlfriend right. in this film. Yes. Um, Martha Plimpton is his sister. Is, right. Is the older, his... At the gay bar. Yes. Um, but Martha Plimpton, she was a model in the, uh, in the early eighties. Mm. She had this weird wild streak toward the uh, middle and end of the eighties. I think she ended up dating Mickey Rourke or someone of that, that sounds about right. odd ilk. Yeah. And then turned to, I think she had a music career and then eventually to acting. Right. Right. I saw she did some Broadway stuff yeah. or Baltimore stage or something too. All kinds too. of, she's had a really eclectic career, but she's Certainly. a Carradine. Yeah. Um, she's the niece of David Carradine. Death Race 2000 was David Carradine. Right. And Hell Ride. Hell Ride. And a, I'm sure a bunch of other yeah, stuff. Yeah, we've seen all of the places. Children of the Corn is, is what we're forgetting. Martha Plimpton, the first time I saw her was in an episode of Fringe. Mm-hmm. At least that's the first time I realized that I had seen her. And then since then, I've gone back into whatever. She was sparse. in the Twin Peaksy one. Yes. Right? Where they're in Seattle or right, whatever. Right. And everything just looks like Bright Falls. Right. And then I went back into her film career and, and the sparse film career she has. Mm-hmm. Now she's in a new TV show that's done by the same guy that did My Name is Earl yeah. called Raising Hope, which I highly advocate. Absolutely <laughs> heinous and hilarious. Yeah. She's fucking hot and great and funny and everything you could possibly want from a heroine in a John Waters film. 
I mean, in anything, really. Yeah, the best you could hope for. Yeah. I'm surprised she gets out as well as she does. Sure. If I were to pick the ideal gay barmaid, it would be Martha Plimpton, 100%. Yeah, you know, women have done a lot worse in John Waters' films than in this one. Maybe that's why I have kind of the soft spot for this movie. Yeah, you're thinking, it's, you know, you're tired of seeing all the female trouble. It's a dirty shame. Wow, we could do this for about two more minutes. Yeah. Well, I mean, she works at a bar. Christina Ricci's character works at a fucking laundromat where she's just, she's not the feminist lesbian. Mm -hmm. By the way, that's also amazing, right? Feminist that they lesbian. have this, this full nudity, Bush inclusive mm -hmm. um, strip stuff at this bar, but it's by feminist lesbians. Sure. That's just the greatest fucking idea yeah. I've ever heard. But, um, you know, she's also got this mean spirit to her, much in the way that the feminist lesbians do. And she's yelling at her, you know, her customers and she's in complete control. Mm -hmm. The worst that ever happens to her is her boyfriend cheats on her. Yeah. But, you know, she's able to kind of go along for the ride. No one is really stepping on her toes or stabbing her with scissors or any of these awful John Waters. That That's not even the worst of it. Those are the safest ones, I can yeah. say. I guess while I've gotten in the habit of just listing off random things I like about this film. Yeah. The, um, That's the best way to handle John Waters. It really is. I mean, you know, I, I always worry about repeating stuff we've already done, and we don't want to do that, but we need more John Waters. Mm -hmm. on that. We need so much more than we're doing. You know, you see a John Waters movie, and I've described before that even in my still continuing sickly state, uh, no matter if you're having a bad day or whatever, you can watch a John Waters movie. And for me anyways... That's the perfect place to be in. Yep. Everything is right with the world. It just feels beautiful. I well, it's love because, his stuff. It's because for people like us and Podmanity, John Waters films have all the irreverent hell that we like in films right. in, in what would be you know a splat pack movie right. or something more exploitation-y. But it's all under the guise of happy 50s housewife. Right. So right. we can smile and listen to sexual innuendo on 50s radio. It's really the feel-good films mm -hmm. of our audience, I think. It is. And where else can you see a movie with two rats fucking, except maybe Mulberry Street or Willard? I guess you could see that if you looked hard enough for it in other places. You're thinking places. of Crispin Glover fucking a wombat. I'm thinking of come on, be a good girl and put your vagina up to the phone is what I'm thinking of. Oh, John Waters. That's John Waters on it the is, phone, on the which phone, is right. awesome. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I like um, the harmless fun of photographing items next to unsuspecting yep. shoppers. I don't know why I don't actually go out and do this. Mm -hmm. This would be a really good time, It would right? be fun. And, and there's, there's nothing wrong nothing with it, wrong and it would be great. Whatsoever. I mean, trouble ensues when they then put the items back into right, their carts guess, or whatever, yeah, and it, it makes it out like it's going to be a, a way bigger disaster uh -huh, than it ever really would right. be. But everyone could copy this uh -huh. and still get these... You know, at the very least, maybe you wouldn't get great photographs out of it, but you would get an amazing, fun experience sure. you could look back on. It's not about the pictures. Right. It's about the road to the pictures. Right. And so rather than everybody's fucking photos on Facebook or whatever, being them out at a bar drinking or from high angles or whatever the hell happens mm -hmm. on the internet, they should go out to stores and take these pictures behind unsuspecting customers. Do that it. would be amazing. Fantastic. If send that, them. If that's send just, them to us at Double Feature Show at gmail.com what i would rather is that if i just go on the facebook group tomorrow yep. next week sometime that you know we'll check back i want everybody's photo to be a photo that they took at the fucking supermarket that would be great that'd be amazing so there is one thing in this film that i despise and it's t it's commentary the film comments on it it touches on it the film knows that it's speaking is it on the it. followers of mary no you know i can actually i can handle that that shit is ridiculous it's, it's so funny though yeah exactly. it really is it's just pointing out how absurd it is the one thing that i cannot stand that this film touches on and it it knows that it's bringing it up mm -hmm. is that every fucking kid under the age of 6 has add and needs ritalin <laughs> right, right that shit drives me up the fucking wall yeah. if you've ever ever encountered a child under the age of six you know what they're doing they're running around screaming asking for candy oh my god doesn't matter if they have add or if they're in a fucking wheelchair sure. it's like trying to subdue sexually active high schoolers sure it's like saying my son wants to have sex all the time he's 18 is there a medication for that right right yeah i mean that's such a weird area for me you know because i know nothing about children mm -hmm. i don't know anything about what it's like being around children i don't know anything about the medication there are these completely rational claims that uh americans are over medicated or whatever mm -hmm. for things like depression or children with uh add adhd what have you and then there's also the opposite side that is completely nuts and thinks that all medications are bad and that sure. you shouldn't take any medications uh -huh. 
So it always feels wrong for me when I look at, you know, if I can just think critically and go, all children are, you know, on sugar rushes and we can't possibly need to medicate as many of them as we do. I find myself standing over near the group of people who think medicines are bad yeah. and hate, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And hate Western science. And, and so that's a really uncomfortable place for me to be. So I just avoid children at all costs. That's probably a good way to go about it. But if you line that up akin to teenagers want to have sex all the time and should be medicated for it, then it's really easy for me to not get behind that and th- think it's fucking ludicrous, as John Waters clearly does. Yes. Right up there with 12 Step and all the other wonderful things he loves. <laughs> And so amongst the pubic hair scenes, we also have the teabagging, which is, uh, this was the popularization of Mm -hmm. teabagging, which has come up a lot more. You know, there's been all these great references to Pecker on the news when all the stuff happened with the tea party. And then there was this whole teabagging slogan thing they did. And I remember seeing all these clips of Pecker, Mm -hmm. you know, showing up on um, TV and stuff, which was just awesome. But yeah, so this is kind of where that came from. John Waters jokes about creating teabagging. I don't know if he actually created the phrase. Most likely not. Yeah. But it was it's it's kind of that found art thing where and you know that's something that even when you see you know I don't know if you've ever seen any of John Waters' photography. No, I can't say I have. It's kind of the the same thing. He'll find stuff and he'll kind of make these photos that are less about the the photo itself, but more about the the item or the context or the conversation that it sort of starts. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of how teabagging was. Uh, it's sort of how a lot of these John Waters issues are, where he just puts them on display, and he he even goes through the pains of explaining in the movie, in such a wonderful bite-sized news-ready quote, what teabagging is. Hey, you can't teabag, you can't put your balls on that guy's head, right. like that needed explaining in the movie. So I think he's completely aware of, I'm going to put this in my movie, and then people are going to talk about it. Right. You know, it's seeing stuff like that, I wonder, I mean, the, the complaint I hear so often from John Waters fans or the critics of the movie when it came out was basically that it's too safe, Yeah, that they expect John Waters to shock them. And they wonder, you know, when the scene that's going to offend them is going to appear and why isn't that in the movie? And that seems like such a fucking awful thing because it's, it's treating John Waters like a one trick pony, right. right? Like he's this sort of attraction. And they only go to him for a certain thing. They just want a certain thing out of him. And that is, you know, his work can't evolve. I mean, we wouldn't have gotten to stuff like A Dirty Shame today if John Waters hadn't gone through that period. The 10 films that were his first mainstream films. And I don't like the idea that people go to him just for the perversion. Yeah. You know, not even just because there's so much more there, but it's it's like this whole story of Pecker Mm -hmm. where he takes these photos and he takes some of his friends and family, and he doesn't even really realize what his art is. Right. And then it's picked up for a reason other than why he took the photos. Mm-hmm. And so all of these people, I guess this is kind of a story about the exact criticism yeah. of the, the movie itself, which is extremely ironic, especially for a movie that, you know, toasts to Pecker and the end of irony, which I really love. But the critics can't even see this shit, right? They think John Waters is quaint. They think it's amusing how he puts his offensive stuff in his little pictures with, <laughs> right. his, with his little poops in his eight millimeter films. And in this very movie they're criticizing, John Waters is making a movie about people in the snobby art world who think that something is quaint and they like it at a distance. They think right. it's ironic and they can't celebrate that for exactly what it is. I mean, you really couldn't have asked for better criticism of the film, could no, you? I guess that's probably it's, true. It's perfect. And even among all that stuff, there's still some kind of commentary about how smaller Baltimore is very different than Mm -hmm. the big city. But how they can still coexist. (laughs) Right. How those uh, how those are two different worlds. I mean, you know, you've lived in the city for a while. I know you go out to the suburbs a little bit more than I do. When Uh I go out to the suburbs, it's still a little weird out there. Yeah, it's weird. And there's nothing wrong about that. There's nothing to look down on. But also to say that that is anything other than the way it is, is false. I mean, that's not, you know, that's not the truth of the matter. We've talked a long time about these movies. We got uh, some more movies and some other shit we're doing on the show. Right. One of those things, as always, is doublefeatureshow.com, our Mm -hmm. website. I mentioned the Facebook. Just go on there, search Double Feature. I want to see those pictures up there. That would yeah, be really cool. That. I'm not great. even going to give the email address this week. I just want people to go and take pictures like from the Film Packer, which also means they'll have to go back and now watch the Film Packer uh-huh. because no one did that. And then put those on the Facebook. Put those as your profile picture. So next time's kind of exciting. It gets us more back to the uh, 
the roots. Really the internal nature of our show. What yeah. are we doing next time? Next time we're going to do a good grindy double feature of yeah. Cannibal Holocaust and the big birdcage. Wow, so this is interesting. So we mentioned Cannibal Holocaust quite a few times. Uh-huh. We've never actually gone into what that is. We never featured it on the show. Mm-hmm. So that'll be good. And I've seen Cannibal Holocaust, so I'm less interested yeah. in, in talking about that right now. What I want to talk about is what the fuck is the big birdcage? The big birdcage is this great Jack Hill flick. Uh-huh. It's a Roger Corman produced Jack Hill woman in cages flick with Beautiful. Pam Greer and Sid Haig set in the Philippines. Oh my God. So this is very exploitation. Oh, it right? is. It is one of the crown jewels of exploitation. I am really pumped for this. It's going to be fucking good. Watch more fucking film. Bye.